By 1943, most of the great capital cities of Europe had fallen victim to the devastation caused by the Second World War, then in its fourth year. The exception was the ancient city of Rome, with its priceless monuments and extraordinary history. Here also was the cradle of Christendom and the Catholic Church, a trove of cultural and architectural treasures considered sacred enough to be beyond the ravages of the conflict. But nevertheless, there was war here. A nine-month tragedy played out in a cauldron of intrigue and betrayal in the city streets, cellars, and even in the staterooms of the Vatican. Jews were hunted down and singled out for the death camps. Partisan heroes and foreign allied agents fought against the torturers of the Gestapo and the SS. The unholy battle for Rome would finally descend to a series of execution chambers called the Ardeatine Caves. In those hellholes, 335 defenseless prisoners were slaughtered to avenge a deed they did not commit. Who were the people who tried to help them? Who couldn't? And who chose not to? At the beginning of September 1943, the Allies were wrapping up a swift, hard 38-day march through Sicily and were at the point of invading the Nazi-held mainland of Italy. The political situation had degenerated to the brink of chaos. Rome was clearly the destination of the Allied armies, and both patriots and nervous opportunists alike were eager to distance themselves from the catastrophic leadership of Italy's fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. Italy had been fighting for eight years, uh, since 1935, e Ethiopia, the Spanish Civil War, and then in 1940 on the side of the Germans. The, the country was sick and tired of war, and there was every indication that they may opt out. They did. On the 25th of July, a coup brought down 20 years of fascist rule. Benito Mussolini was arrested, vilified, and locked away. Marshal Pietro Badoglio, who had commanded the Italian conquest of Ethiopia in 1936 and later the disastrous invasion of Greece in 1940, was appointed leader of a new government. The Allied invasion force that disembarked at Salerno on the 8th of September 1943 was fully anticipated by the Germans. But they were taken completely by surprise by the American General Eisenhower's announcement that the new Italian administration had covertly agreed to unconditional surrender and armistice five days earlier. The Badoglio government had betrayed Germany and the Nazis were enraged. The capitulation meant the Italian army was not only no longer available to defend the road northwards to Rome, but it was probably going to join the Allies in the campaign against them. At this critical moment, Badoglio and the members of his government committed a craven act of cowardice. Fearing Nazi reprisals, they fled from Rome without leaving orders for 55 Italian divisions to attack the Germans, as agreed in the armistice document. The defection paralyzed the Italian chain of command, allowing the vastly outnumbered Germans to crush, disarm, and disband a whole army. In this one gutless act, Badoglio had betrayed everyone, his Axis partners, the Germans, the Allies, and also his own countrymen. When Italy was his chief ally, Hitler had needed little more than a constabulary force in Rome, numbering only 1,500 men. However, when the possibility of a civilian uprising supported by Italian troops loomed, the Germans increased their strength by rushing in makeshift but effective reinforcements. These included tough units from the Luftwaffe, the Afrika Corps, and the SS, all supported in key places by armored cars. Massively heavy and powerful Tiger tanks were deployed to fire at any partisans brave enough to oppose them. Spirited resistance was quickly subdued, and the Germans took control of Rome. 414 Italian soldiers and 183 civilians, including 27 women, died defending the city. While the British troops had come ashore easily and without mishap in the invasion of the 8th of September, 
the Americans landed at a much more hazardous location. Although Hitler's brilliant commander in Italy, Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, had intended to abandon Rome and pull back northwards, he quickly changed his plans. He observed that the Allies had given him a defender's dream scenario. They'd elected to enter the Italian mainland deep in the south, landing on the beaches at Salerno below Naples instead of coming in north of Rome to cut him off and secure the capital. Italy possesses some of Europe's most formidable mountain ranges, crossed by many swift rivers. These presented an endless sequence of natural barriers upon which to build defensive lines. With few decent roads through the mountain passes, Kesselring's defense lines could check the Allied advances on Rome yard by yard. What the Germans begin to do is to build north of the Volturno River a series of positions which collectively are known as the Winter Mountain. Italy is granite and marble. It's not dirt in most cases. And you find real engineer units with air drills, uh, with heavy equipment, and with a tremendous amount of blasting done that are building uh, caves and defenses and battle positions that literally interlap from one end of Italy to the other. The Allies occupied Naples less than a month after they landed. The timetable for reaching Rome looked good. But they had not yet reached the hostile terrain upon which Kesselring had chosen to build three successive defensive lines. The Barbara, the Bernhard, and the Gustav. The German forces that are withdrawing from the Naples area uh, withdraw into these already made positions. And as those soldiers take up those positions, the engineers move north to the next line, which is to be called the Gustav Line. Rome, the prize for the Allies, was tense and expectant. While other great world capitals lay in ruins, her ancient splendors, the pride of Western civilization, remained serenely if precariously intact. Rome's best and virtually only defense against indiscriminate attack was the awesome spiritual presence at its heart. Rome was the holy city. At its center was the 108 acres of the Vatican City, a sovereign papal city-state within a secular state, now under Nazi rule. The citadel of the most powerful church in Christendom was surrounded by the most powerful forces of evil in Europe. On the chair of St. Peter sat an austere and complex pope. Eugenio Pacelli, Pius XII, the 262nd man to occupy the position of supreme pontiff, was trying to balance the morality of the church he represented with the agenda of a cruel occupier who held the power to crush it. To brutalize the holy city and the man who for hundreds of millions of Catholics was the representative of Christ on earth was something Adolf Hitler could not undertake lightly whatever the needs of his military strategy. The Reich and the Vatican negotiated gingerly with each other, each with its layers of formal diplomats, each with its shrouded plans and intentions. Everything was played out in the shadow of a callous army underpinned by its Gestapo and SS enforcers, and a madman in Berlin. The German war machinery rumbling through Rome had drawn targeted Allied bombing since the 19th of July but nothing as severe as the wholesale destruction that rained down on other European cities. St. Peter's Basilica, the Pantheon, the Colosseum, and centuries of architectural gems remained inviolate. Now that the Italians were no longer Hitler's allies, the Germans were free to apply the unpalatable priorities of the Third Reich in Rome as they had elsewhere. Why should Rome be different from Poland? There were not so many Jews in the ghetto in Rome, but nevertheless, they were all to be gathered up to meet a grim fate at Auschwitz. By the middle of September 1943, Field Marshal Kesselring was successfully allowing the Allies to exhaust themselves, fighting against successive defensive positions, while he withdrew slowly to the strongest of them, the Gustav Line. Any hope that the Germans would abandon Rome quickly soon evaporated. Casualties mounted, and the American Fifth Army's commanding general showed little inclination for making full and effective use of his allies. 
Mark Clark was one of the most unpopular uh, generals of World War II. He was a brilliant staff officer. Uh, he was ruthless in uh, eliminating incompetent officers, but he was also arrogant. Rarely ever took any advice, uh, rarely ever asked for it. And he just overrode uh, subordinates. Clark was jealous because the Italian campaign was under the overall command of the British general, Harold Alexander whom he saw as a man determined to steal credit and glory from the Americans in general, and from him in particular. As all hope of a rapid conquest of Rome faded, the Germans found themselves able to control the demoralized civilian population with relatively few troops. But to cleanse the city of its Jews, they needed to import some of their best experts. The Iron Fist of Berlin came to Rome in the person of 36-year-old SS Major Herbert Kaplan recently promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. He liked roses, Etruscan vases, and dogs. He was also a fervent Nazi. A colleague said of him, he was pitiless and became the blind instrument of the implacable Gestapo. His second in command, 30-year-old Erich Priebke, was also promoted to captain. They received a telephone call from Berlin soon after their arrival. On the line was Reichsführer Heinrich Himmler, who wished to proceed with the arrest and deportation of all the Jews in Rome as quickly as possible. A radio message later confirmed a final solution to the Jewish question in the recently occupied Italian territories. Rome's Jewish community was proud of its heritage and its record of outlasting centuries of sporadic persecution. These people constituted the most durable Jewish community in the Western world, having lived along the River Tiber for 2,000 years. Even though they had some indication of what was happening in the rest of Europe to uh, Jewish communities that were being uh, destroyed, they felt that they had the protection of the Pope. Pius XII was ascetic, solitary, and aloof, driven by piety and a steely spirituality. No one loved Rome and its deep symbolic meaning for the Catholic Church more than he did. But the Vatican was ringed with German troops, and the Church's very existence in the city was subject to Hitler's whim. The Pope tried hard to be seen by both sides as neutral. He had remained neutral despite the disquieting evidence of the slaughter of Europe's Jews. But what would he do if such slaughter occurred at his own gates? On the 26th of September, the Gestapo boss, Herbert Kapler, summoned the Jewish leaders and presented them with a stark demand. Within 36 hours, you will have to pay 50 kilograms of gold. If you pay, no harm will come to you. In any other event, 200 of your Jews will be taken and deported to Germany, where they will be sent to the Russian frontier or otherwise rendered innocuous. Kapler, in the moment in which Kapler, at the time he requested gold from the Jews of Rome, was perfectly aware that the idea of a roundup had been in the air since the end of September. He always said, this request for gold was an invention of mine to put off or try to avoid the roundup. This too was a resounding lie. He perfectly well knew that Wolf, the SS chief of police in Italy, had already assigned to him companies of police for the roundup. The Jews surrendered wedding rings and other items of jewelry and even gold fillings from their teeth to make up the tribute. Kapler sent the heavy crate to the Berlin office of the head of the Reich security apparatus, General Ernst Kaltenbrunner. Unimpressed, Kaltenbrunner sent back a note that ended, proceed with the evacuation of the Jews without further delay. The gold was found in his office after the war, the crate still nailed shut. The most bizarre part of the unfolding story was the way in which the Nazi diplomats in Rome conspired vigorously against the approaching atrocities. German ambassador to the Holy See, Baron Ernst von Weissacker, and his second-in-command, Teddy von Kessel, were the most vehemently anti-Nazi Germans in the city. They supported the Pope's efforts to mediate a separate peace with Hitler as the only hope for their ravaged fatherland. 
Although he had received no direct word of the plan to deport the Jewish population of Rome, Weissacker had begun to hear about summary executions of individual Jews in Italian towns to the north. He sent Teddy von Kessel to discreetly alert their leaders and warn them that their people must flee or go into hiding. Roman Jews numbered some 12,000. Many were concentrated in the old ghetto near the city center. They'd survived millennia of menace on the banks of the Tiber, and most shrugged off the advice to vanish with patient forbearance. When told that his warning was being greeted with skepticism, Weissacker became extremely frustrated, and von Kessel voiced his growing anxiety, saying, if the Jews don't disappear at once, every last one of them will be deported, and their blood will be on our hands. I tell Friedrich Mollhausen, was a young consul in the German embassy and something of an anomaly. He wasn't a member of the Nazi party, and he had a penchant for helping Jews. With the encouragement of Teddy von Kessel, he sent a bombshell of a telegram addressed personally to the foreign minister of the Third Reich, Joachim von Ribbentrop. His first sentence read, Kapler has received orders from Berlin to seize the 8,000 Jews living in Rome and transport them to northern Italy, where they are to be liquidated. He went on to suggest that it would be a better idea to have the Jews retained for a labor force in and around Rome. Von Ribbentrop exploded, not at the shocking substance of the message, but at the word liquidated, referring to Jews and addressed in his name. Words that would one day put a rope around his neck. He flatly ordered Mulhausen to stop his meddling. In Berlin, the internal opposition to the roundup of the Jews had generated such concern that the matter was given to Adolf Eichmann. He decided that Rome needed some more of his best men. Accordingly, on the 6th of October, a tall, handsome officer, Captain Theodor Danica, accompanied by a crack detachment of the Waffen-SS's Death's Head Corps, arrived in Rome. His 14 officers and NCOs and 30 soldiers had served on the Eastern Front as Einsatzgruppen, Hitler's mobile death squads. The chief rabbi of Rome, Israel Zoli, was an Eastern European Jew who had the fear of pogroms in his blood. He urged the closure of the synagogues and the withdrawal of all bank funds in order to use the money to disperse the community. When his plea was ignored, he went into hiding. At 5 a.m. on Saturday, the 16th of October, the roundup began. Italian policemen who were likely to warn the Jews had already been arrested by Kapler. Somehow, many Jews were spirited into hiding in church properties inside and outside the Vatican, always having to dodge relentless searches by Nazi arrest squads. Most were less fortunate. Jews crammed into trucks were passing through the field of vision from the very windows of the Vatican. Declassified Vatican documents record a meeting that morning between Ambassador Weissacker and the Papal Secretary of State, Cardinal Malione. Malione spoke of the pain caused to the Pope by the Roundup and his wish for Berlin to intervene against it. But here, Malione shifted the burden of that intervention from the shoulders of the papacy to Weissacker, saying that the Holy See was not wanting to be faced with the need to express its disapproval. Diplomatic doublespeak for papal unwillingness to provoke Berlin's retribution by stepping away from the church's studied neutrality. After Weissacker left, Malione noted, I was leaving it to his judgment whether or not to mention our conversation. Unfortunately, Weissacker's lips seemed to remain as tight shut on the subject of intervention as the Pope's, and the roundup went ahead. Of the 1,023 Jews arrested in Rome on the 16th of October and sent by freight train to Auschwitz, only 16 would come back, and one of those had been rescued at the brink of death from a pile of corpses. In December 1943, the Allied offensive became stalled 78 miles south of Rome on the Gustav Line, which was anchored around the towering Monte Cassino. Protected by swift rivers, including the Rapido and the Garigliano, and their lowland marshes, the mountain would have been murderously difficult to climb, much less assault with full battle equipment under fire from Nazi snipers.
The German position commanded the Liri River Valley and Route 6, the only road to Rome passable by armoured vehicles. Ironically, beyond its symbolic value as an Axis capital, Rome counted for very little militarily, in a campaign that itself served as a reluctant second front, undertaken largely to placate the hard-pressed Russians. The Italian campaign had no strategic objective. The, the, only, the only place that they were, they were told to actually capture was Rome. And Rome itself had no, no tactical value. But increasingly, the stalemate in front of the capital was becoming symbolic of ongoing failure in the Italian campaign. As early as November, of 1943. The Allies were already considering what other means they might be able to take in order to break this growing stalemate. Anzio, as a possible target, began to crop into their thinking. An amphibious operation, Operation Shingle, looked good on paper. The VI Corps, comprising two Allied divisions, was supposed to land at Anzio, 35 miles southeast of Rome, and 80 miles north of the German 10th Army defending the Gustav Line. Facing the spectre of his southern army being trapped by having its road to Rome cut, Kesselring would have to withdraw. No defensible terrain remaining between the Allies and Rome, the Eternal City must therefore fall. OSS agent Peter Tompkins, an American who had lived in Italy for many years, was selected for a behind-the-lines mission to obtain urgent military intelligence and see if partisans could stage an uprising to coordinate with the Anzio attack and speed up the German withdrawal. General Donovan, head of the OSS, agreed that they would send an officer, an OSS officer, into Rome to make a deal with the military junta of the Committee of National Liberation. So I landed behind the lines and went into Rome. A young police officer who later died, he gave his life for us, uh, brought me a piece of paper from the uh, police headquarters in Rome, showing where every German was in Rome, all of them. There were 1,500 of them. And there were about 6,000 armed partisans. We could have taken the city. But that rare opportunity was squandered. The Anzio landing on the 22nd of January 1944 began well enough. 50,000 American and British troops and 5,000 vehicles went ashore, supported by bombarding warships and massive air cover. The handful of German defenders surrendered, still in their underwear. The plan required a rapid advance into the Alban Hills to cut the crucial road to Rome. An Allied jeep patrol that went ahead of the main force found itself driving up that road. The bridges of the River Tiber came into view before it spotted a single German. The way to Rome was wide open and not taken. In his memoirs, Field Marshal Alexander puts the blame on General Lucas, who commanded Six Corps. He said if he'd had been more adventurous, he would have done what he was supposed to do, which is push up on the Alban Hills with his uh, armored division, and that would have done it. But he didn't move. The real key to it is Alexander, who arrived on the beachhead the same morning, looked at Lucas, said, OK, great, you've landed all your stuff. We've surprised the Germans. Now dig in and wait for them to attack. The minute nobody moved from the beachhead, Hitler gave Kesselring orders, throw them back into the sea. I will send you troops from France, from the Balkans, from Germany, and they started to pour in. We thought we would scare Kesselring. Instead, all we did was, was turn the, the German army against us at Anzio. Without hesitation, Kesselring committed his reserve. By midnight, of D-Day, the Germans had managed to scrape together almost 20,000 troops. Initially, Kesselring threw them into blocking positions so that there would be no way out on the obvious approaches to Rome. Within a matter of a couple of weeks, the Germans had 100,000 
men defending the Anzio beachhead. It was no longer possible to break out of the beachhead because uh, uh, the Germans were massing all around it. That's when our job changed from insurrection in Rome to cause the Germans to pull out to try to inform the beachhead what the Germans were doing. Now, as all the roads lead to Rome, the only way to do it was to put about 100 men on all the streets in Rome, 24 hours a day, marking everything that went by. Even with Tomkin's critical intelligence reports helping to prepare the defense, the massive German attack came within a hair's breadth of throwing the Sixth Corps back into the sea. By the morning of the 17th, four depleted American battalions found themselves facing the equivalent of six German divisions. The odds were roughly 15 to 1. A Nazi breakthrough would split the beachhead in two and destroy it. But by sunset on the 18th, the fifth day of the attack, the Americans were turning back the last of the German attackers. It cost some 3,500 American lives. The Germans lost almost 5,500. They just couldn't quite make it. And uh, Kesselring's chief of staff, General Westphal, says, well, the trouble was they knew exactly when we were coming, where we were coming, and what strength, so we couldn't do it. Thanks to Peter Tompkins' brilliant spying exercise, the beachhead would hold out. But the Allies were still frozen out of Rome on two fronts. The mood in the Eternal City was dark and about to get even blacker. When the partisans of Rome heard the rumble of artillery fire from Anzio in late January, they sensed fast rescue, and so they abandoned discipline and security procedures to make rash attacks, including the spectacular blowing up of a German petrol wagon with grenades in broad daylight. The Gestapo and SS pounced on the suddenly exposed partisans, smashing their cells and dragging captives into the torture chambers of the infamous Regina Celi prison and the Gestapo prison in the Via Tasso. La paura c'era, però poi, insomma, non era poi così. Fear there was, but it wasn't so bad. Con tanto terrore, ecco. I don't remember living with so much terror. I do remember it being always a very lively period, very powerful. Fear was doubtless present, but then one gets used to almost anything. Pietro Koch who was half German and half Italian, came to Rome as head of the most ruthless anti-partisan force in the city. It became known infamously as the Koch Gang. With the Gestapo leaders, Kapler and Priebke, he captured and tortured many of the partisan leaders. Kapler was very impulsive lost his temper easily. Kripka was very cold, very controlled. He told my friend Arago in one of his many interrogations, 12, 13 of them, that in the end he would talk. If he did, he would spare himself much pain. They insisted specially on the address of Peter Tompkins. That was one of the things they wanted to know most. That had the highest priority. Eric Priebke tortured not for sport, but for the information that dead men could not give him. Brass knuckles were his favorite tool, breaking jaws and teeth without taking life, at least for a time. Whips were then used until no more flesh could be safely spared, and then the beating was switched to chains, wielded skillfully to tear sinews and break bones. In the first days of spring 1944, the partisans devised a plan to regalvanize the cowed population of Rome. March 23rd, 1944, 
was the, uh, the 25th anniversary of the establishment of, of fascism. And the plan was to strike on that day to show that, that the resistance is, is out there. A company of the SS Bozen Battalion was scheduled to parade through Rome along a predetermined route. The point where the Via Rosella made a sharp turn was an ideal place for an ambush. Four squads of partisans, 16 men and a woman, prepared to make the biggest, most successful, and ultimately disastrous strike of their war. Preparammo in un carretto da spazzino una mina. We prepared a street cleaner's cart with a bomb with 18 kilos of TNT. I wheeled it from the Colosseum to Via Rosella. Poi, su Via del Boccaccio, on Via Boccaccio, there were four comrades. As attack weapons, they had regular Italian army mortar bombs. They were modified into hand grenades by having the safety substituted by a four-second fuse. When they were thrown, they had the effect of hand grenades. I lit the fuse in the cart at 15.32 on the 23rd of March. The column was all knocked down with several dead. Many were killed by the sympathetic explosion of their own hand grenades attached to their belts. They were set off by the explosion of the cart. The Bozen Battalion was shattered. Of 156 soldiers, 33 died and about 60 were wounded. When a furious Adolf Hitler heard the news at his headquarters, the Wolf's Lair in East Prussia, his orders were stark. He, he wanted to make a reprisal that would make the world tremble, he said. That was what he said. And he demanded that 50 Italians be killed for every German soldier who lost his life. Kesselring decided that 10 rather than 50 Italian lives for each dead German would be sufficient reprisal. But that did nothing to lessen the dismay of the German diplomats in Rome, and one of them took action. Eugène Dolman had two roles in Rome. The visible one was as a highly placed colonel of the SS, and the other, clandestine role, was to do all that he could to avoid going down in what he saw as Hitler's inevitable defeat. Dismayed by the reports of Hitler's rage, Dolman rushed to warn Padre Pancrazio, the Pope's personal liaison officer to the occupation hierarchy, of what was coming. He wanted Pancrazio to inform the Pope and persuade him to ask the Germans for a delay in the executions in order to allow tempers to cool and a less drastic punishment be imposed. Was the total lack of action that followed a result of the information of the planned barbarism not being passed upwards to the Pope? A recently declassified Vatican document, known as the Governor Torato Note, was received and time-stamped by the Vatican Secretariat of State at 10.15 a.m. on the 24th of March, 1944. It laid out the events in the Via Rosella and stated baldly, the countermeasures are not yet known. It is, however, foreseen that for every German killed, 10 Italians will be executed. The reaction from the Vatican was in accord with its usual policy of neutrality silence, in order to maintain the trust and forbearance of the Germans. No request for delay or clemency from the papacy having been received, Kapler's death squad went into action. Kapler had to work through the night on his list of candidates for the death sentence, having been given a 24-hour deadline. He'd hoped to achieve a large part of his allocation from prisoners already condemned to death or men serving life sentences. But when he found only three of those, he had to improvise wildly to make up his quota of 320 criminals. He ordered the Italian fascists to deliver him some victims. 
But then, the death of another German soldier demanded another 10 men for execution. Kapler had 10 Jews arrested that morning and put on the cattle wagons to Germany immediately. He redoubled his efforts to find the number of required new victims. He had to set an example of a stalwart German soldier doing his duty. And he would. He would in a way that Rome would never forget. SS Colonel Herbert Kapler reinforced his death list with snap choices of people in detention or scheduled to be released. He added shopkeepers, Italian soldiers, policemen, Jews, teachers, students, architects, priests, old men and teenage boys. Then Kapler made his grisly calculations. He had 74 men at his disposal, so the executioners were outnumbered five to one by the condemned. He described his planning procedure proudly. I calculated the number of minutes necessary for the killing of each of the 320. I had the arms and ammunition computed. I divided my men into small platoons, which would function alternately. I ordered that each man fire only one shot. I specified that the bullet enter the victim's brain from the cerebellum in order that there be no wasted firing. The doomed Italians were loaded onto trucks that afternoon and hauled like cattle to some abandoned caves in an area where early Christians had been condemned to martyrdom. The approaching executions would be every bit as pitiless and gruesome as those in ancient Rome. The Ardeatine Caves formed a perfect death chamber, eliminating the problems of witnesses and the disposal of corpses. They comprised a dank labyrinth of passageways 10 feet wide, 15 feet high, and up to 300 feet long. It would be a simple task for Wehrmacht engineers to seal the entrances with explosives after the deed was done. The executioners were an amateur bunch. Most had never killed anyone. Many of them were clerical workers with no military training. Kapler sent cases of brandy to the caves to soothe the nerves of his amateur executioners. But rather than calm them, the strong liquor led to a hideous orgy of drunken murder. The bound victims were led by torchlight in groups of five into the bowels of the caves, each group accompanied by five of Kapler's henchmen. At an intersection, Kapler's second-in-command, Priebke, stood, ticking the names off his master list as the condemned men identified themselves to him. Then each was forced to kneel and turn his head to the correct angle to receive his bullet. From 2 o'clock in the afternoon until 8 o'clock in the evening, the systematic murder of the prisoners continued unabated. The slaughter became progressively more hideous and chaotic. Kapler's drunken executioners became more and more careless as horror and exhaustion overtook them. The system broke down. Bullets were poorly aimed and maimed without killing. To save time clearing the bodies, new victims were made to stand on the corpses of the newly dead until there were two five-foot-high heaps before the final shot echoed through the darkness. When an account of the massacre was given to the Pope by his confessor, he raised both hands in horror and cried out, it cannot be. His last hope that the Germans would be too civilized to carry out their threat died in the Ardeatine caves. Count Della Torre, chief editor of the Vatican newspaper Osservatore Romano, wrote a scathing front-page editorial that would be understood by all, although unsigned, to be the voice of the Pope himself. But the published piece, as revised for Pius XII, reduced the vibrant protest to a general censure of tragic violence. His fear was that an already grave situation would only worsen. So according to the Vatican paper, the victims were the Germans, uh, the culprits were the partisans, and the people massacred were sacrificed. At 11 p.m. on the 11th of May, the Allies launched Operation Diadem on the casino front, hurling stealthily massed strength into a pulverizing assault that finally crossed the Rapido and Galileano rivers into the long-blocked Liri Valley. On the 23rd of May, 
a heavily reinforced VI Corps sprang Operation Buffalo, the northern half of the Allied pincer, at last breaking out of the Anzio beachhead. General Clark was ordered to move east from Anzio to trap the German armies retreating from the south. Instead, however, he rushed the main elements of his army towards Rome to prevent the British from getting there first and stealing his triumph. An historian would describe this move as militarily stupid as it was insubordinate. As Clark was making only a token attempt to cut them off, the Nazi units retreated northwards with ease, ahead of his arrival. Instead of being destroyed in a trap, Kesselring was free to form new defensive lines above Rome and continue to campaign until the end of the war. Clark had achieved his dream of being first inside Rome. He had all the headlines, his moment of glory, and possession of a city still undamaged. Tompkins' partisans had cleverly secured the city's infrastructure and monuments against Nazi sabotage. June 4th, we delivered the city to them absolutely intact. And that's again, all of this is due to the Italian partisans wanting to help the Allies, giving their lives. 20 of, 20 of my closest workers are dead, were, were shot and buried in the Ardeatine caves. In addition to the estimated 66,000 partisans killed or wounded resisting the Germans, some 312,000 Allied soldiers became casualties in the invasion of Italy, including the battle for Rome. Somehow, in one of the war's hardest-fought campaigns, a major city had not become a Stalingrad or a Dresden. The treasures of art and architecture of the Eternal City survived intact. It seemed miraculous. By the time the war in Europe ended in May 1945, there was nothing left of the unholy battle for Rome except bitterness, mourning, a search for retribution, and the grief-stricken contemplation of crimes of both commission and omission. The Pope celebrated a huge victory mass in St. Peter's Square, where he was cheered and venerated. Meanwhile, justice was meted out to the most reprehensible of the German occupiers. Pietro Koch received 17 bullets from a firing squad. Captain Theodor Danica hanged himself in his cell. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring's death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment, and he was released in 1952. Herbert Kapler was also given a life sentence, but he escaped in 1977 and died in Germany in his 70s. SS Captain Eric Priebke escaped to Argentina and occasionally returned to Rome for his holidays. Eventually captured in 1994, he was given a life sentence to be served under house arrest. To this day, the attack in the Via Rasella that ended in the slaughter in the Ardeatine caves weighs heavily on the hearts of old partisans. It's a wound that doesn't heal. While they refused to take responsibility, they weren't even given a chance to surrender themselves to the Germans. Yet, you know, the connection is there. And it's very painful to listen to these elderly people, old people, talk at a time of peace of the meaning of an act of war. To this day, Pius XII remains at the center of the controversy surrounding the occupation. By some, he's considered a candidate for sainthood, for serving as a heroic mediator in the tragic events of the war, and for his role in hiding Jewish fugitives in church buildings. But others suggest that his conduct in the unholy battle for Rome should earn him the title, the Saint of Silence. More than half a century after 90,000 Allied soldiers and Italian citizens fell, in the nine-month battle to attain it, Rome continues to endure, fulfilling its destiny as the eternal city, full of memories.